Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship at Victoria Methodist Centre. And we'll stay in part online. Welcome. There is one notice, and that's at 6 p.m. We are holding a prayer vigil for our Queen Elizabeth II. The prayer of preparation can be found on the screen or on the view sheet. We will come quietly before the Lord before we say this prayer. Then I will lead into the prayer of preparation. So let's have some moments. Shall we say, Almighty oh, God, as we start our worship, we acknowledge your responsibility for our thoughts. We praise you that the Son shares your King Jesus, sent by you to save us from our sinful selves. Help us in all our aspects of our worship to deliver our name from being and rituals. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's great to be back with you. It seems quite a while since I was stood here, so it's good to see some familiar faces again. Uh, just to introduce myself to those on the stream and those of you who might not know me, I'm, as we've just heard, I'm Mark Robinson. It's strange to have the plan where it just says Robinson, rather than M. Robinson, D. Robinson, S. Robinson. But well, I'm here, still here in this circuit, and it's good to be here with you. But we've come, hopefully we've all come with the good intentions to worship God. And we do that as we sing our first hymn. Praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation.
thanks and praise. And we come to adore you this morning, for you are the King of creation. Maybe on our journeys to church this morning, we have seen your creation in all of its glory. We have marveled at the things that we have seen as we have come to church. For the wonderful weather, for the crisp, fresh air that we're getting now. We look at all the things that you have made, Lord. We look at each other. We look at ourselves. You made each one of us, Lord. And we praise you, Lord, that you aren't just a king of creation. You created us and then left us to our own devices. But you are a living God. You live in us every day as we journey along with you. And so, as you journey along with us, Lord, you see our good parts of us, but also you see some parts of us that we're not too pleased with. The aspects of our lives that we want to come this morning and say, sorry, Lord, for things that we have done this week. The things that we have done, maybe the things that we haven't done, maybe the things that we said or perhaps haven't said, we come to you now and apologise, Lord. And in a few moments of silence, we offer up our own individual prayers of confession. Thanks, Lord, that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to this world to be sacrificed on the cross so that our sins can be forgiven. And so as we move on in our worship, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come and dwell amongst us as we hear from your word, as we praise you, and as we leave this building later on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we continue on the, on the theme of praise as we sing our next hymn, a great hymn of praise. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
that have been. That is quite controversial. I wonder if you went around all the churches in this circuit this morning and they saw the lectionary reading, what they would pull out of those lectionary readings and what they would preach on. It's a topic that often preachers would tend to try and avoid and not preach about. That theme is anger. Now I see some relief faces because you thought it might be something else. <laughs> but it is just anger. But it's a big topic. You know, it's a, it's a true fact that all humans get angry at something or another. And I want to ask you the simple question this morning, what do you get angry about? Thankfully for you, I've avoided the temptation of breaking you out into groups to discuss this. But have a little think, and I don't want you know, answers being shouted out because that's also awkward, but what do you get angry about? I'm going to talk about what I get angry about because I think it's good to sort of get it all out there. For example, I'm a big Arsenal fan. <laughs> and for the last couple of seasons, I couldn't help but be, at the very least, frustrated at how we were playing. It's even become to a situation where my partner, who lives with me, we come to some sort of agreement that she will go back to her parents for the evening <laughs> whilst Arsenal are playing. Because I don't like how she sees me when Arsenal are playing or playing badly. So that's a good example. Yesterday, me and my partner went to watch Bath Rugby and they got absolutely thrashed. <laughs> they were awful. And you had people all around us shouting at the players getting angry at them. It's interesting how anger comes out in sports matches, isn't it? There's something about a group of people who have had uh, different weeks, maybe tricky weeks, and they come all together on a Saturday afternoon and just let it all out. That's sport for you. Well, I play sports as well. I play cricket for our church team back in Midsummer Norton. And I'm predominantly a batter, or at least that's what they call people who have a stick in their hands who should be hitting the ball. <coughs> and every time I get out to a silly shot that I shouldn't have played, I was, until I improved myself, I was well known for going back into the change rooms in a sulk and throwing my pads around, my gloves around, and have the tantrum. Thankfully, this season and the last couple of seasons, I've learned that isn't the best approach to go. Cricket is a fickle game, really. You can do really well one week and the next week you come crashing down. That, help, that happens both at a professional level and in the most village of levels that I play in. But it's interesting when you get angry, isn't it? I wonder. How many of you are driven here this morning? Show of hands. And I'll ask you to put your hands down for the next question. How many of you have got angry? Don't show your hands here. <laughs> Road rage is a thing. Is a thing. Just driving through Cainshire this morning, going through the roundabouts with people who don't indicate. And you just want to shout out your window, but you can't. In all honesty, I found myself over the last few months when I've been driving, listening to UCB radio, which is a Christian radio. And whilst I've been listening to that, I've also had road rage. And it doesn't really match up. And I sort of, you know, when stuff happens on the road, I get angry. I say, why are you doing this? Why have you pulled out in front of me? Why have you put your indicator on? And then suddenly I listen to the radio and it's in the middle of a prayer or in the middle of a reading. And suddenly I have to come back to God and say, sorry Lord, I should have got angry at that. And it doesn't really match up. We see things uh, in our society where people get angry, don't we? We've had quite the interesting 
couple of weeks with the Queen's passing. And there was a couple of instances this week where people have been venting their anger, their frustration at the monarchy. I wonder whether you've seen that and the crowd's responses to said people who are getting angry. I wonder what we get angry about. And then I wonder whether those things are godly things that we can share the injustices that God gets angry about, or whether they are just meaningless things like crickets or car road rage. See, there are plenty of injustices out there, and we can so easily get angry and frustrated about those instead. But often we focus on other things that don't mean a lot in their true uh, perspective of things. But we'll come and look more on the theme of anger later when we hear from our readings. But in the interim, we're going to pray for our world, a world that is in need of prayer, especially at the moment, and especially where there is places where people do get angry, in, in areas of war and terror. For the situation in Ukraine we'll be praying for as well. So let us pray. Creator God, we firstly and foremostly give thanks for the life of Her Most Gracious Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. We honour her life of service built on a firm foundation of faith and a commitment to duty. Especially with her funeral tomorrow, Lord, we pray you will comfort those who mourn and bring peace to those in distress. Father God, we pray for those areas in the world which are full of anger, which are full of conflict, and terror. We continue to pray for the nation of Ukraine and all of its people, all the people involved in that crisis, and all the people who have fled from that crisis but might be struggling to find a home. We pray that you will comfort those people, that there will be a sense of peace in that nation, that you will give wisdom to the leaders who make decisions around that situation. We pray for those who are being affected by climate crisis. And especially, Lord, we pray today for those who have suffered from the floods in Pakistan, whose homes have been wrecked, whose lives have been upturned. We pray that you will bring calm in that situation, that homes and shelters will be found, that they will know your light and your peace. We pray for the injustices of this world. Those who are homeless this morning. Those who live in poverty. Those having to choose between heating or eating this winter. We pray for an end to their struggles. We pray for a sustainable living for those people. We pray for a light at the end of the tunnel, that they know your light and your hope. Mm. 
And more locally, Lord, we pray for this community of Cainship and the communities watching online this morning. We pray for those who are in need, those who are on our streets and our neighbours who need our help. We pray for this church, Lord, for all the members, gatherers this morning, but also the people who couldn't make it this morning for whatever reason. We pray that your Holy Spirit will inspire us to serve those who are in need. And in a few moments silence, we pray for those who come to mind who need our prayers at this time. situations we've we've prayed for Lord that you will be there presence in every situation and so as we pray for the world we pray for our offering this week those of financial gifts but also those of time and talents we pray that you will use all these things for the advancement of your kingdom in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And so we sing again, we sing a hymn which is probably my favourite hymn because I feel it's one of the most complete hymns there is to sing. So we sing, in Christ alone, my hope is found. <laughs>
Luke's Gospel. Thank you. The reading this morning is from Luke, chapter 16, verses 1 to 16. The Shrewd Manager Jesus said to his disciples, There once was a rich man who had a servant who managed his property. The rich man was told that the manager was wasting his master's money. So he called him in and said, What is this I hear about you? Hand in a complete account of your handling of my property, because you cannot be my manager any longer. The servant said to himself, My master is going to dismiss me from my job. What shall I do? I'm not strong enough to dig ditches, and I'm ashamed to beg. Now, I know what I will do. Then, when my job is gone, I shall have friends who will welcome me into their homes. So he called in all the people who were in debt to his master. He asked the first one, How much do you owe my master? One hundred barrels of olive oil, he answered. Here is your account, the manager told him. Sit down and write fifty. Then he asked another one. And you? How much do you owe? A thousand sacks of wheat, he answered. Here is your account, the manager told him. Write eight hundred. As a result, the master of this dishonest manager praised him for doing such a shrewd thing, because the people of this world are much more shrewd in handling their affairs than the people who belong to the light. And Jesus went on to say, And so I tell you, make friends for yourself with worldly wealth, so that when it gives out, you will be welcomed in the eternal home. Whoever is faithful in small matters will be faithful in large ones. Whoever is dishonest in small matters will be dishonest in large ones. If then you have not been faithful in handling worldly wealth, how can you be trusted with true wealth? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what belongs to you? No servant can be the slave of two masters. He will hate one and love the other. He will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the second reading is Psalm 79, verses 1 to 9. A prayer for the nation's deliverance. O oh God, the heathen have invaded your land. They have desecrated your holy temple and have left Jerusalem in ruins. They left the bodies of your people for the vultures, the bodies of your servants for wild animals to eat. They shed your people's blood like water. Blood flowed like water all through Jerusalem and no one was left to bury the dead. The surrounding nations insult us. They laugh at us and mock us. <clears throat> Lord, will you be angry with us forever? Will your anger continue to burn like fire? Turn your anger on the nations that do not worship you, on the people that do not pray to you. For they have killed your people. They have ruined your country. Do not punish us for the sins of our ancestors. Have mercy on us now. We have lost all hope. Help us, O God, and save us. Rescue us and forgive our sins for the sake of your own honour. Quite a 
challenging two passages, isn't it? And we'll be trying to unpack uh, those in a few moments' time. But we're going to sing, and we're going to sing Spirit of the Living God, and we're going to sing this through twice. Maybe I realised that I was still in a family car 
not in an F1 race. <laughs> Whatever the reason, right before impact, I slammed on the brakes and stopped just short of his car. With all the Christian love I had, I rolled down the window and shouted at the top of my lungs, What do you think you're doing? You know I had eye lock, you idiot. Now you're going to make me really late, you red sport car driving loser. After rejoining the other ants, we searched for another 20 minutes and finally found a parking spot. We dashed from store to store, breathing heavy in our rush. As we entered WH Smith's, we should approach, who should approach us but my old friend, the driver of the red car. Just great. Images of my picture with the headline, local pastor assaults man over parking space, flashed through my mind. I can tell you in a bit of a hurry, he said, as my blood pressure continued to rise. But it appears you have more going on in your life than you can handle. My wife at this point gave me the remember you're a pastor and better behave yourself look as the driver continued. I'd like to tell you about someone who can really help, Jesus. I really believe you need him and he can change your life. Ouch. Ouch. That must have hurt. It's like that famous old phrase about the child who asked his mother whilst they were driving, why is it that all the idiots are out whilst daddy's driving, mummy? <laughs> Well, this parable that we've heard just right then comes in a series of parables. This one is after the parable of the lost son. Quite chalk and cheese but between the two different moods of the parable. In, in their day, the Jews were forbidden to lend money at interest, but many got around this by lending uh, through commodities. So later on, when the servant gets found out and the master or the manager has torn a strip off him, he gets everyone back in and tries to get back as much as he can. He tries to cut out the commission that he's made in the hope of goodwill later on. He comes back to the master or the manager and says, this is what I've done. And whilst he was impressed with how he was acting in a shrewd nature, I'm not too sure he was too pleased still. Well, the different points that we're going to go through this morning uh, are all to do with anger. We just heard about the car a story of anger, but also in our gospel reading of how the manager was angry at how the servant acted. The first thing to note here this morning is that God gets angry. It's biblical. You look at the stories in the Old Testament of Adam and Eve, where God gets angry at what happens between the both of them. You look at the story of Noah and the flood, and he floods everything apart from what's on the ark. And then in the Exodus, um, in chapter 20, where it goes through the commands, it says this, You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything, in heaven, above, or on the earth, beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them in worship, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents, to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations 
of those who love me and keep my commands. A few moments ago we sung the great hymn in Christ alone my hope is found. And for some people they get a little bit itchy when it comes to the line, till on that cross as Jesus dies, the wrath of God was satisfied. There have been many churches around this nation and many other nations who have attempted to change the words of this hymn, who have stumbled upon copyright protocols. There's been a movement of churches who have wanted to change it from till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, and to replace it with as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. Now it's true that that is a good lyric, that to celebrate God's love on the cross, but it's also important to note that it was something that happened at God's anger, but also his love for his people. God gets angry. And when we hear in our New Testament readings, we search for what it has to be said about God getting angry. In Romans 5, chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 9, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Don't we think that God might get angry? We look at our society today, how the world is acting. Don't we think that God will get angry at those things? We look at climate change. We look at the effect that it is having on the planet that God created. Don't we think that God is angry at that situation, of how we are all contributing to that? Don't you think God gets angry when we all fall out with each other? Maybe that's on an individual basis, or as nations falling out with each other. And we can argue about whether God still gets angry now. And we can delve into that wormhole of whether God is still angry. Well, I don't want to focus that on, on that this morning. Well, all I want to say on that is I don't want to test the theory. I don't want to test that theory of God getting angry. We don't want to test his patience. We don't want to disappoint our God. It's like that famous parental phrase, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. We don't want to hear that from God, neither. And so, as I believe that God gets angry, it's certainly true that we get angry. Without wanting to turn this into a therapy session, there are different things that get us hot under the collar. We need to step back and think, are they worth getting angry about? When I'm driving through ancient nets, and I see someone not indicating, is it worth getting angry about? When you think about the things that you get angry about, if there was a scale from mild frustration to the red mist coming down, where do those things rank on that scale? It's funny because when you think of anger, you think of other words like frustration, annoyance, bickering amongst one another. But what I think about also is passion. When I think back to yesterday in the rugby, when you have lots of people shouting in anger, it's because they're passionate about the team. They're passionate about how they perform. And so I wonder, what are you passionate about? Do we align those passions with God's passions? Do we align our angers and frustrations with the world with God's anger and frustrations for the world? My challenge for us this morning 
is to of course think before we act or think before we feel the anger but most importantly to open our hearts up to what God is feeling the frustration about for this world to open our hearts up to the things that are breaking God's heart what are those things you might ask well a few years ago I was sat just as you were sat in the congregation and someone was talking and preaching about injustices and we all prayed a prayer after the sermon a simple prayer of Lord we pray that our hearts will be broken for things that break yours and since then I've seen the world in a different light I've seen the world more through God's eyes than mankind's eyes things that God gets frustrated about, the injustices of this world, the people who we might have seen on our way to church were sleeping on the streets, our neighbours who are struggling to get by at the moment, for a world that is crumbling through climate crisis, for the situation in Ukraine, for the war and terror, for the floods in Pakistan, the people who are out there struggling with mental illnesses. God's heart's broken for those people, for those situations. And so are ours broken too. It's one thing to be focused on God's frustrations, another thing to be focused on our frustrations. But it's important to ask the question of so what? So what? What does that mean? What, what do I do? Well, once our hearts are broken, are melted with the things that break God, we then go from this building. We have that passion. We have that uh, eagerness to try and do something about it. To not just walk on by to the homeless man who's sleeping on the streets. To not just ignore our neighbour who we know is struggling, but to do something about it. I finish with a quote from a song. It's a song from Vicky Beachy, and in the chorus it says this, and our prayer for this morning Break our hearts with the things that break yours. Wake us up to see through your eyes. Break our hearts with the with the things that break yours and send us out to shine in the darkness. Amen. And so we, we sing, we sing a challenging hymn and I wasn't too sure whether to pick this this morning because it is such a challenging hymn in all the lyrics that are involved. And as I was preparing for this service, I was humming and ahhing upstairs about whether to pick it. I finished my service prep and thought I'll just pray about where to use this song. I go downstairs and what is my sister singing? She's singing this hymn. She had no idea. And so, to me, that's a sign from God that we had to sing this song. It is challenging. I encourage you to think about these lyrics before we sort of sing them as we sing Take My Life and Let It Be.
challenges about anger, frustration, passion. And so, Lord, we pray as we are about to leave this building <coughs> that you will be with us in the situations where we might get frustrated, where we might feel temperatures will rise. We pray that you'll be there to bring us peace, to bring us calmness, to bring us clarity in our thinking and in our speaking. We pray, Lord, this morning that our hearts will be broken for the things that break yours. Let us see the world through your eyes, Lord, we pray. But we pray that we won't just look at those things through your eyes, but we'll be moved into action. We'll be moved into serving you in those areas which break your heart. And so as we go in a moment, Lord, we pray that you will prompt us those situations, those things that we can do in this week and the weeks to come, where we can serve you, where we can make the world a more peaceful place, where we can challenge injustices. We pray that we'll be faithful servants to you this week and all that might happen in all the people we might see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we finish our worship with a hymn which talks about serving Jesus. O oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end.
and serve you more faithfully. Amen.